Coming up on this episode of Inside the Epicenter. So we've had our two, two of our boys um, have already served. One of them has finished his service and the other is still currently serving. Mm -hmm. But moving there and learning the language, you know, when you're a teenager, life is hard knowing your identity, figuring out who you are, then if you add to it that all your peers don't speak your language and have a culture that they've grown up in that you don't know kind of how to operate in, they were very, very brave. And there was lots of uh, prayer and lots of questioning. One of our favorite uh, little phrases was an Elizabeth Elliot quote, which says, don't dig up in doubt what you planted in faith. Mm. And we would remind ourselves of, okay, why are we, why did we say this was a good idea? That's, that's great. Um, that's a great line. <laughs> Don't dig up in doubt what you planted in faith. That's, that's a great theme to live your life <laughs> by for sure. Hi, welcome to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. My name is Carl Muller, the executive director of the Joshua Fund. And I'm very excited today to have as our very special guest, the co-founder of the Joshua Fund, Lynn Rosenberg. Lynn, it's a privilege to have you with us. And I am thrilled to get a chance just a little bit today to hear your story and to understand a little bit more about how you and Joel founded the Joshua Fund and where your heart is now for ministry in the area. So welcome to Inside the Epicenter. Thanks so much, Carl. It's really fun to have a chance to talk to you today. Well, you know, it's kind of fun because uh, both Joel and I have said, uh, as, as we've uh, done these episodes, you know, it's really a story that involves both Lynn and Joel as founding and, and setting the direction and the heart for this. Lynn, I would love to know your story, and I'm sure everyone listening would love to know, you know, how, how Lynn Rosenberg's story and journey came to be. So tell us a little bit about like your childhood and, uh, and, and where you grew up and, and maybe some of the ways that uh, God started to impress upon you a, a heart for him and a heart for ministry. Well, uh, I grew up in New Jersey on the New Jersey shore. My father was a school teacher in an inner city school um, about an hour north of where we were living in a little town on the beach. So I grew up there and going to church in a small little town church. Um, we only had one Jewish family in our whole town. We didn't have any African-American people in our whole town. It was a very Italian kind of a town, I would say, Polish, Italian. Um, but because my father was a teacher in this inner city school, I spent a lot of time there. And I had a different growing up than a lot of my neighbors, you know, because he taught uh, tennis and I loved being there with him. And when I got old enough, I started student teaching there. And so um, they had a lot of an immigrant population there from Haiti. So I, I was there hearing French and... Um, and there was a lot of troubles in the school. It was uh, one step below where they have police guarding the doors. <laughs> wow. But um, I really feel that my dad's heart for those students, he was really a father for a lot of those kids, um, a father figure. I feel like he really shaped my understanding from a very young age that the world was bigger than this little kind of bubble of a town that I grew up in. So... Our church was, I wouldn't say, a strong spiritual place. It was people that were very kind, people that um, were very sociable, but I didn't really learn a lot of the Bible growing mm. up. And so that wasn't until I got to college. And that's also where I met Joel, which yeah. was um, in student ministry there on campus. So uh, back to your childhood, though, the, the, yeah. uh, do you have uh, brothers and sisters? I mean, uh, tell me about uh, how the brothers and sisters uh, that you grew up with <laughs> uh, and where their journey has been. Yeah, I have. Uh, I'm the oldest of three, so yeah. I have a brother and then a sister. Um, my sister's the youngest. And like I said, we didn't grow up with a strong Christian faith, I would say. It was more of a traditional Christian upbringing, morals and values, but not necessarily um, the gospel or a relationship with God. That wasn't anything we understood. Sure, um, like, good, like good people. 
But Good people, be yeah. honest, be loyal, mm -hmm. be faithful, be hardworking. That was a huge mm -hmm. emphasis, I would say, of my parents. They both grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My father was the first to go to college in his family. So uh, they were working in mines and factories and that kind of thing. So there was a very much of a, we are going to work hard and not complain about it. <laughs> that was my but, you know, my brother and sister actually both became Christians. My brother's a pastor now. Wow. My sister's married to a worship leader at the church, and she works with the children's ministry. So all of us really went on a spiritual journey. Yeah. So somewhere in that process, you know, there was a seed, there was a uh, good soil, or at least the brokenness of that soil so that God's seed could germinate. So you said you met Joel in college. Where did you go to college? Well, he and I both went to Syracuse University. That's in upstate New York. Love Very it. cold. We call it Siberacuse. <laughs> no excuse. A lot of bad nicknames. <laughs> we were both in the drama department. I was studying acting and he was studying filmmaking. Uh, we would see each other around the theater from time to time, but we met in a student ministry group on campus. He was a year ahead of me, so he was already the MC of all the meetings. So he was up front, and sure. you couldn't miss knowing Joel Rosenberg when you were there. <laughs> so. That's awesome. So, so tell me about the first time you saw or thought about Joel in a in, in a way, perhaps more than a different as a friend. Maybe how that relationship began to take root. Well, I know it sounds very cheesy and cliche, but I will really truly say it was for me, love at first sight. He was hilarious and he had such a heart for God and people and he was adorable. I thought he was pretty adorable and cute. So, uh, so yeah, I, I was smitten from the first moments of uh, our paths crossing, but I was a brand new baby Christian and he had grown up in a really solid Christian home. He was already, like I said, a student leader a year ahead of me. So I thought there's no way he will even look my direction. <laughs> I'm just this little, uh, you know, baby freshman. Christian. Yeah, yeah that's freshman. Right. <laughs> so I didn't have a whole lot of hope that anything would come of it. And it did take a long while till, till junior year, till we first started dating. Wow. Cool. <laughs> that's fantastic, Lynn. I love to hear someone's story about how they you know, met their spouse and how they, you know, came to fall in love and, and start a ministry, start a journey together uh, and build a family. It's it's really amazing. So I guess you could say that you and Joel had started to intertwine your paths even before you were you were grown, uh, before you actually knew where God was going to take you and lead you. What did you think about those those early directions for your life? Where where did you think God was taking you? Well, you know, um, Joel was, like I said, studying uh, filmmaking, and he had so many interests. He was fascinated with politics, with the Middle East, with journalism, with international relations, and he was a very outside-of-the-box kind of thinker, which I was very excited about because I thought from a young age that my life would be somehow with international people or overseas. And so um, I knew that marrying him was going to be a big adventure. It's been even a bigger adventure than I could have <laughs> imagined. But, um, you know, it's really amazing. Uh, you know how it says in Hebrews chapter 12 that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Mm -hmm. And then in Psalm, um, I think it's Psalm 139, it says how uh, every day of our life was written in his book before we've even lived one. And I can look back and see, you know, God was planting seeds and preparing me for this life, even from when I was a little girl, not just like I said about my dad, but about um, my best friend was the only Jewish girl in town. I got to go to her father's or her brother's bar mitzvah. And I, <laughs> I remember my first Passover and I thought, can I be Jewish? I want to be Jewish. <laughs> so the fact that the Lord introduced me to Joel, this Jewish believer, I just thought sure. this is amazing, amazing. So, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, uh, we share that same background. I, uh, I grew up in New Jersey as well. And uh, I remember when I was in elementary school, my friends uh, going off to Hebrew school after school together. And I would go to my mom and go, mom, why can't I go to Hebrew school? <laughs> and, and she would say, because we're Protestants. That's why. And I didn't understand any of that. I just wanted to, you know, be part of that whole uh, culture as well. So yeah. that's, really, you, that's really, that's really cool. see that Jesus was Jewish and then you begin to read the gospels from this Jewish perspective and you just want to keep 
understanding it more and more. Amen. And so, Amen. Yeah, yeah. It opens okay. things up. So you and Joel then um, started working in the United States. You moved to Virginia and you were working in politics, but something changed about that. Um, you started getting into, into a different uh, line of work, I guess. Uh, talk about that a little bit. What were some of the stories from those early, those years of transitioning uh, from the work in politics into, into ministry? Yeah, um, well, you know, when we first moved to Washington, I knew I wanted a job with international people. And so I wrote my resume based on all the experience I'd had with international people. And I took my copies and walked up and down Embassy Row. And each country's embassy, I would look and think, am I interested in that country? Yeah, OK. And if I, you know, so I went to Italy and uh, Egypt and all the countries that caught my attention. And I ended up getting my first job at the Embassy of Japan helping them editing their speeches and being basically an assistant, which was fine. It was fascinating. Two hour lunch breaks. That was the best part. But, um, <laughs> but then I, I changed to, to be a mother. Uh, so we have four sons and I always wanted to be at home with them. Just like my mom was at home with me and my, my siblings. Um, mm -hmm. and so Joel, you know, and I agreed on that and he really was, excited the Lord provided a job just before our first son was born that was exactly our two salaries put together so our budget didn't change at all we just like went seamlessly into a into a family but yeah, as our provision yeah it's amazing how God provided um, really was such a desire of our hearts and he really provided but um but yeah, Joel, like I said, loved politics. And um, our first vision of what we thought might maybe God would do was to have him work in the White House, become like a former famous somebody in politics. <laughs> and, then <we'd, laughs> and, then go <laughs> and then we'd go into ministry and that would be kind of our platform or something. But as he likes to say, everybody he works for in politics uh, loses. So he never did get to work, work in the White House or be a former famous anybody. But, you know, we really actually poured ourselves into our church. That's really um, mm. where we found the greatest satisfaction was working with the young people in our church and discipling young people, new believers. Our church is a seeker church, so it's a huge place. Lots of young people trying to kind of figure out what's Christianity about. It was like a fishing pond of hungry, hungry fish. <laughs> so we loved, uh, we loved feeding those fish. We loved having all those young people to our home. And so our kids really grew up in a home that was a center of ministry and discipleship from the time they were little. Amazing. But our heart always was to get overseas, to get to Israel. And um, we tried to take it into our own hands at one point and uh, applied for graduate school at Hebrew University here in Jerusalem. Okay. We got accepted. We got even a stipend, like a living expenses. And then we had a family crisis in our extended mm. family. We deferred that for one year. And uh, by the time the year came around, the funding for the stipend had all dried up and we weren't able to go. <laughs> wow. It was that heartbreaking, would, that really. That would be heartbreaking, yeah, I'm sure. And it must have been a time of of challenge for both of you guys as, you know, Joel's working in, in the political range and then starts writing a book. Talk about that a little bit because, you know, obviously that precipitated a, a massive change in your lives. Yeah, 100%. He... Um, after his final presidential campaign uh, ended and crashed and burned, he decided to start a communications company on his own and just write for pe other people. But on the side, he decided to start writing his first novel. And, you know, he'd always dreamed of being a storyteller, whether it was films or novels or even telling the, the stories on the news. That was always his focus in life. So I was really excited. I remember we were going on a trip to Disney World with our little boys driving there and he kind of hesitantly gave me his first I don't know three four chapters or something of this book I hadn't read anything at that point and he was driving and I was reading it out loud and as I kept reading I said this is really good I kept reading faster and faster and <laughs> I didn't want to stop and um, it, I didn't care about motion sickness and um, it was amazing God really um, blessed his creativity and in the timing of everything, the way a team of the publisher and the agent, it was just amazing. And it was a family 
prayer mission. You know, our little boys, we would all pray, Daddy, first he needed a story, and then Daddy needs a, an editor. What's an editor? You know, Daddy needs an agent. Well, what's an agent? So it was a great educational and faith journey for all of us. And then it just, God did something with it we could not have uh, dreamed or imagined more than we thought. So, yeah, that opened up the doors to just suddenly go. Yeah. I'm sure. Well, what a what a faith journey. Hey, Lynn, we're going to take a quick break right now. And when we come back, I want to ask you a few more questions about where your heart for ministry is and and a little bit about what life has been like for you and Joel since those early days of the Joshua Fund. So sure. hang on for just a moment. This is Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund. Scripture tells us that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Would you take a moment right now to pray for our staff at the Joshua Fund as they work to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus? We're in a battle against the evil one, and your prayers make all the difference. Well, we're back. There's Lynn Rosenberg. Uh, Lynn's just had her cat with us. Uh, that's remarkable. We should have had the cat on for the interview. Lynn, oh, yeah. thanks so Rosie much. Rosie Rosenberg. She's, she's quite the star. What's her name? Rosie Rosenberg. <laughs> Rosie Rosenberg. I love it. That's great. Uh, Lynn, you know, the idea of the Joshua Fund, where did that, where did that come from? And how did that, how did that germinate inside you and Joel? Well, you know, as Joel had written this novel and it became a bigger deal and he started to get so many invitations to speak on radio and television, um, he also got invited to speak at Christian conferences and different gatherings, churches. And so we were invited to speak out in Canada, in Western Canada, to a gathering of major donors for the same student organization that we'd met. So we said yes right away, of course. We had, we had a debt to pay to that student ministry. Ministry. And while we were out there and Joel was speaking, you know, he he would speak about the books. He's happy to talk about the life of a novelist, even though he was new to it and uh, where he got the ideas. But really, it would always come back to what he's most passionate about is is Jesus and the people, our friends in the Middle East and um, what they needed, what their hopes were, what God was doing, how he was moving in the Middle East. And he would love to tell those kind of stories. Um, so anyway, Joel had spoken there at the conference and afterwards, separately from each other, two different couples came up and said, we want to give you a check. We have an amount in mind. We want to give you so that you can bless Israel. We love Israel. We love your heart for Israel and what you've just shared with us. We can see God is doing something in your lives and we want to be a part of it. And we thought, well, we don't know exactly what God's doing in our lives. We don't have a ministry. Uh, we don't have any ability to give you a, a check, you know, a, a receipt or a tax deduction or anything. But it was quite startling. It was a, it was an amazing um, moment, I'd say, really, with the Lord that he was saying something new is going to come from this, something I've been planning. And uh, it was an exciting moment to just see him at work. Uh, we hadn't asked anybody for any money. <laughs> we didn't have any projects we were planning. So, but one of the, the, the leaders there of that ministry had said, you know, we'll open a temporary account for you so that you can give them a receipt and uh, you can put the money in an account. But we believe God is doing something in your lives and you need to go back to Washington, D.C. and pray about what that is and start something. And so that's what we did. We went that's back beautiful. to... Uh, yeah, we went back to Northern Virginia. We gathered some some really trusted and experienced uh, friends around us, around our dining room table. Also a couple from Canada that had been um, very interested in what Joel had said, that had um, a lot of experience running their own charitable organization. So we were so grateful for their expertise. So they were on speakerphone in the middle of the table. And we just were saying, what does it mean to bless Israel? What is that going to look mm. like? Th that was our, our whole plan was, okay, we want to be a blessing to Israel and her neighbors. And yes. that's the part that gets always a little bit 
different than um, than most other ways of thinking, I'd say, in this part of the mm. world. And so what is that going to look like? That was our, our prayer and our question around the dining room table as we were signing papers to start an organization with a very general mission at the beginning and not a lot of specifics. <laughs> well, you know, I, I would just love to have been a fly on the wall during those conversations about the early ideas. Uh, again, you like you said, uh, the Joshua Fund uh, mission is to, to bless Israel and her neighbors, those three words, very pivotal in the name of Jesus. And uh, I love the fact that you and Joel stepped into that with boldness to be able to do that with some friends and, and some other leaders. So as the years went on, though, and you're raising four boys, you and Joel made a profound decision for your family, and that was to make Aliyah. If people don't know what that means, that means to emigrate to Israel. <laughs> how, yeah. how did that how did that take place? And and what was that like for you and the family moving your whole family to Israel? You know, it was a big adventure. And I'm sure it's been a lot more than we imagined it would be a much bigger uh, bite that we took. And um, you know, we had started, even when they were very little, we had started traveling to Israel fairly regularly, at least once a year. Sometimes Joel would be here more than that for long periods in the summer. So our kids really grew up coming here. But it's one thing to come as a tourist. That was the first trip we ever took, was as tourists. You know, Joel had been here studying uh, in university in the international program, but none of us had even ever been to the country. So we came when we just had three boys, and then we kept coming over and over again over the years. We would bring little groups of friends sometimes. We'd bring just one other family. And we would spend the summer getting to know people here, getting to know Israelis, getting to know Arab Christians, getting to know different congregations, different ministries, and serving. And we loved it. So our boys loved the ministry, and they really grew up in it. But it's a very different thing to sell your nice big house <laughs> in the woods in Fairfax, Virginia, where all your friends and family are, and, um, and really kind of burn your bridges that, you know, there was nowhere to go home to <laughs> and to move here. We like to joke that the, the honeymoon period of, of moving to Israel was just the plane ride. <laughs> we were very excited. And then uh, really, it was very difficult from the time we landed, you know, with our feet on the ground. It's not sure. easy to move with. We at that time had four, you know, adolescent boys, four mm. teenagers. Joel likes to joke that now we know why Moses and Sarah came here without any children. You know, that the children only came after. It's difficult. Well, it was diff difficult. You know, it's it's so true. It's like a, it, it, raising a family cross culturally that has that has unique challenges and both in terms of like language, but culture and and so many other dimensions. What were what were some of the things you remember from raising, you know, the boys there and 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 seeing, you know, seeing their growth as as now? Uh, I know I, I know most of them, if not all of them are dual citizens as well. Um, is that how did that how did that work? Well, you know, we came here as a family. We came here planning and praying and asking God together for unity, that we weren't just sort of dragging them here, that this was a family project, that the reason we were coming was because we loved Israel, we loved this part of the world, and there's a lot of needs here, and we wanted to be part of that, part of what God's doing, but on the ground. So they all agreed to that <laughs> over lots of conversations, lots of family devotions, lots of uh, prayer times together, and you know, we told them, now, Dad and I, we're not going to have to serve in the army because we're too old and out of shape anyway. So they're not going to want us. But you four young, healthy men are all going to be asked to do that. You know, so this is serious. We're not just going to take you there without you guys thinking through as much as you can as a young boy, you know, whether you're going to be willing to do that when you turn 18. Mm. So... We've had our two, two of our boys um, have already served. One of them has finished his service and the other is still currently serving. Mm. But moving there and learning the language, you know, when you're a teenager, life is hard, knowing your identity, figuring out who you are. Then if you add to it that all your peers don't speak your language and have a culture that they've grown up in that you don't know kind of how to operate in, 
they were very, very brave. And there was lots of uh, prayer and lots of questioning. One of our favorite uh, little phrases was an Elizabeth Elliot quote, which says, don't dig up in doubt what you planted in faith. Mm. And we would remind ourselves of, okay, why are we, why did we say this was a good idea? That's that's great. Um, That's a great line. (laughs) Don't dig up in doubt what you planted in faith. That's, that's a great theme to live your life by for sure. Yeah. It's easy to start questioning when the rubber kind of hits the road and the kids are having a hard time. We went to a church where the youth group was four kids. So uh, my three almost doubled the, the youth group. <laughs> and um, Quite a change from young, Northern Virginia, I'm sure. Quite a change, yeah. yes. They didn't have any, you know, ski youth group trips and lock-ins and all the American things you imagine growing up, you know, as a young person. But there is actually a wonderful youth movement here among the churches in Israel. And so our boys actually from the, I think it was the second week we were here, some friends told us now there's going to be a youth camp out up near Jerusalem. And uh, your three uh, youth, you know, boys that are old enough, they should all come. It's going to start with a family picnic up in the hills outside Jerusalem. There's going to be a music and a, and a cookout. And then all the parents leave and the kids have a whole overnight sleepover camp out. So we had to quickly figure out where do you buy a sleeping bag in Israel? What's the word for sleeping bag? Um, <laughs> my best friend in Israel that, that I'd met you know, a few years earlier, she, she told me, oh, the store where you buy a, a camping supplies is called um, Rikoshet. I said, Rikoshet, okay. So I'm walking in the mall up and down looking for a sign that says Don't Rikoshet. Tell me. Don't tell me. It's a ricochet. That's what is the name of it. I'm like asking people, is there a ricochet store? A ricochet store? It was just, yeah. But anyway, we bought the sleeping bags. We drove the hour from where we were living by the coast up into the hills, had a lovely time, you know, trying to kind of get to know some people and then left these three young men there alone. And as we were driving back thinking, well, was that a good idea? How are they going to handle that? But They've done really well. They've they've learned the language. They have a community of friends that are going to be friends for life. And um, it's been amazing to see the transformation and God's faithfulness over these years to get us through these hardest parts. (laughs) That's beautiful. It's such a great part of your story. And and again, so unique uh, in so many ways to to see you lead this uh, ministry together and you also lead this family together like that. That's beautiful. So, Mm -hmm. so Lynn, shifting gears just slightly here, you know, the Joshua Fund does so many things in Israel and in the lands uh, of her neighbors. Uh, you know, we, the, the whole mission to bless Israel and her neighbors has, has so many dimensions of, of things, including humanitarian aid and various other things. But what part of the Joshua Fund's work is closest to your heart? Hmm. Wow, that's really a hard question um, because there are just, I try not to get too emotional when I start talking like this because these people that we serve are my heroes. I mean, these are people that we've gotten to know, um, people who are serving among the Bedouins, these very like marginalized people living in the desert in, in tents and without any kind of connection almost to the modern world. Or there's a ministry that brings, one of the ones that most makes me most excited is, is a ministry that brings uh, children who have life-threatening heart conditions from Arab countries, from Iraq, and also from Gaza, from Syria, brings them to Israel. And Jewish Israeli doctors and also Arab doctors in the hospitals of Israel are donating their time to do these life-saving wow. surgeries. Wow. But while the families are here, it's usually months at a time, they're living in a home that's provided. It's like a it's like almost like a little hotel, but it's really more like a house. It's with a living room and it's communal living that has a devotions every morning and is really a Christian community. So you've got these Arab Muslim people who have been told their whole lives that Israel is horrible, that Israel's the enemy, that they won't ever do anything good for you. And suddenly you're living in a Christian context where you've got Jewish Israelis saving your children's lives. Wow. And it's unbelievable. How it's beautiful. just 
that's one of my favorite um, things that we get to support. And, you know, we've been able to help buy a vehicle for that ministry so they can take you know, when you've got children that are sick but are in different um, stages of recovery, they're here for months and months, and there's a lot of just time that they're not at the doctor's. So we got them, uh, helped them get a van so they could take the kids to the beach or to the park, also that they could take them to their appointments more easily. And um, so that's been really, really special. I think one of my favorite moments with us, with our family, we were here um, before we moved here, when our boys were young, and our youngest, Noah, was just probably three or four years old, and we were part of putting on a special event for Holocaust survivors. Mm. And it was in a beautiful community center here in Jerusalem, and Joel, we had at that time, one of Joel's books was in Hebrew and Russian, so we gave, the most of them were Russian speakers, a lot of them, we gave them these Russian uh, books of Joel's, and then Joel gave sort of a little talk as the author. And then there was a, a string quartet that played classical music. Mm. And then we served them a beautiful lunch. Maybe it was, I don't know, 50 people, 100 people. And my boys were all part of the, serving the meals. And my youngest just was, he loved it. He loved refilling the bread baskets. He would just run back and forth. and. So I loved seeing us be able to serve as a family, but I also loved watching the faces of these older people. As soon as that music started of that quartet, they just were like taken to a different place. They just felt honored. They felt loved and honored and cared for. And I think that's, you know, the heart of what we're doing is loving people, honoring them in the name of Jesus. And uh, that was a really special memory I have for so. sure for sure it is it's so beautiful to see your heart uh, for that ministry and, and I know you also have a heart a special heart for women uh, in Israel and the Palestinian territories uh, in the work that you do talk about that a little bit yeah um, you know it's just like I said how God writes stories and new chapters that we hadn't anticipated like I said back in Washington I was really involved in discipleship ministry and forming a discipleship ministry among the women in a, our large church with branches and and different campuses and so when I came here that was my heart still was to just to work with younger women and also it turned out that a lot of the women, ministry leaders in Israel, like they are worldwide, I'd say, they just need kind of the ministry of the crying shoulder, mm -hmm. you know, the wet shoulder, they say, yes. just to go and have coffee and sit and listen and cry together and pray together over the hard things of life, of children and of ministry. And I just started doing that kind of with neighbors and naturally as it, as it unfolded. And then my next door neighbor was um, the wife of the Bible college president here in Israel. And she came to me one day and she said, Lynn, they've asked me to start a women's ministry department at the Bible College. And I told them I'm not doing it unless Lynn's going to be my right hand person. So will you do it? I said, uh, OK, well, I said, let me talk to Joel. Let me pray about that, you know, um, because she said, because it's going to mean you're going to have to get a master's degree because you can't teach at the college without oh, a master's my. degree. I said, uh, it's been about 25 years since I've had to do any kind of a schoolwork. But anyway, so that has been so exciting. We're now two years into a program, which is which is offered almost fully scholarship. So none of the women have to actually, you know, pay for it. They come to the college once a week and we have half of the women are from a Jewish background mm. and half are from an Arab background. Wow. And we didn't plan it that way. We opened it to everybody and invited them. And that's just the way that God brought everyone. So these are women who are serving God and serving their communities in sacrificial ways. And we're just coming along to try to equip them. We're teaching them basic counseling, teaching them. Um, one course is called Women in Pain, which mm. is a really cheery title mm, but for still, a class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually looking at what are the major crises that could come in a woman's life, whether it's the loss of a child or whether it's suicide or whether it's uh, poverty, all kinds of, you know, whether it's abortion, a lot of different issues that might come into a woman's life, crises. And so understanding how do we help someone? How do we walk with someone 
through those valleys um, and out the other side. So it's been beautiful to see the unity in this group of about 24 students and teachers. We mostly just love to hug and have coffee and baklava, but we do study also. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that would be awesome. So you have you have Arab background and Jewish Christian background students in this class. Talk about the interactions between them and, and maybe is there, is there something that stands out in your mind about maybe a conversation between such different backgrounds and women coming together? You know, I really wondered when we all showed up for that first day of class, would all the Arabic speakers sort of sit together in one half of the room and would all the Jewish uh, Hebrew speakers be on the other half of the room? And I'm telling you right from the very first, from the beginning, they were blended together. I think part of it was that we we prayed for, actually about two years, prayed and planned for this whole program. But right before the school year started, we took them all away to the Galilee for a retreat. And that was really the first time they met one another. Several of the women had gone through terrible traumas in their life. One of the women had lost a child to terrorism, for instance. And we knew her very well, and we asked her if she'd be willing to share her story at that retreat. And then another one of the women from the Arab side, she and her sister, they had had a beloved brother that was just killed in a car accident, tragically. So we had them share about how their family was coping. And I would say at that retreat and through stories of just human pain, all those walls got broken down. Amen. And it, it was, we were sisters. So when we showed up in class, the first class, we were one group. Wow. We were not a mixture. We were a group and it was beautiful. And only the Lord breaks down those walls. Wow. Amen. What a, what a beautiful <laughs> testimony. What a great story of how God can tear down the, the, the highest and thickest walls of division. You can't think of bigger ones than between the Arabic and Jewish worlds. And yet God is capable of doing that. How is, how's ministering to women in these areas deepened your faith and, and trust in what God is able to do? Well, I think it's definitely changed my perspective and my prayer life. I think that before I used to pray that God would change circumstances, you know, that God would make things easier, that he would provide a good school for my children or a friend for my, you know, my child or um, an opportunity. And I feel like God refocused the prayers from the circumstances to the heart to pray for character development, to pray for a deeper knowledge of who God is, mm -hmm. how to know his presence, how to hold on to him in those dark times. Because um, there's not an ability to just escape from the hard things of life. I know we've certainly seen that this year worldwide with COVID. Um, but I think that's the biggest change has been my, my prayer life. I'm not praying for new circumstances. I'm praying for me, my ability and the ability of the people I want to minister to, to understand where God is in the circumstances, what he's doing. Sure. How can we experience the joy he gives um, rather than looking for an escape? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Lynn, what, what do you see? What do you hope for the Joshua Fund going forward? What, what do you hope that God would do through you and through Joel and through the ministry of the Joshua Fund going forward? Wow, he's done so much. He has brought a team together that are so excellent at what they do that for us, it's such an honor to serve alongside them, including yourself, Carl. We're so grateful the way God brought you into our, onto our team this past year. I just pray that more people will know what God's doing, that we can have um, more people join us to learn about what God's doing, to be prayer warriors for us, for the people here. Um, when the skies reopen to come, <laughs> to come back and see this pl beautiful place. And, you know, and obviously to contribute towards the needs here, which are enormous. Huge. And wow, we would love to just be able to reach more and more people to serve more and more people, whether it's refugees or people, you know, that have um, that are new immigrants from from refugee communities that have come in. There's so much need. And I also really am praying for a younger generation to kind of also get this vision. I want to see college students and um, young adults 
really starting to have their eyes open to, wow, Israel, what is it all about? And this part of the world is a place actually of hope. And, oh, I don't have to choose sides. I can learn about this whole big picture that is actually a picture of a lot of hope and not so much of the news you hear. So that's another thing I'd love to see is just more young people to learn and to join us. That is beautiful. And, and I couldn't agree more. And, and, and as you said, you know, it's been my privilege to come to the Joshua Fund this year and to see finally, in some ways, a ministry, an organization that is not choosing sides, but that says it's God's intent to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I love that. Lynn, what can we be praying for you and your family and, and the parts of your ministry that you've talked about? We, we definitely want to be in prayer for you and have every one of our listeners lift you and, and the ministry up. What are, what are the things on your heart? Um, well, thanks for that question. Um, I think, you know, prayer for these women students as we enter our last year studying together. It's, it's a two-year program. We're starting to ask them to consider how are they going to take what they've learned back to their congregations and what does God have for them? So I just am praying that God would be speaking to these women, giving them new, fresh ideas for how to serve their communities, how to reach their communities with God's love. You know, of course, we've had to be meeting on Zoom like most of the world, and that's been a bummer. Can't have hugs and coffee on Zoom exactly. So I'm really praying God will change the circumstances enough that we can really gather more often. So prayer for just that we won't lose our connection to people in a time of social distance, um, and that we'll just keep our eyes focused on trusting God and asking him to give us new dreams. I believe he's got always something new around the corner, and I'm, I'm excited about what that will be. So asking us, you know, just to have ears to hear where he's taking us. Mm. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I have to say, Lynn, uh, we're, we're coming to the end of our podcast here, but I just have to say it's such a joy for me to have this conversation with you and to, for our listeners, I'm sure just having this window into your life and your heart and your ministry alongside Joel is just, is just remarkable. So on behalf of uh, Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg uh, and, <laughs> and the Joshua Fund, I want to thank you for being with us today. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been lovely. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lynn. And thank you for listening to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. And in this episode, Lynn Rosenberg. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund a ministry dedicated to the blessing of Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. You know, we would love it if you, if you've enjoyed this podcast, would sign up for our email uh, at the Joshua Fund. You can do that on our website at joshuafund.com. Also, we have lots of opportunities for you to share with us your stories and opportunities for you to find out more about what God is doing in the epicenter. Again, on behalf of Joel Rosenberg and the entire Epicenter podcast team, my name is Carl Muller, and I want to thank you for listening. <laughs>